You know, a few weeks ago, I was kind of having a hard time trying to figure out what I wanted to speak about tonight uh, for this year's Easter service. And I was talking with Louise about it, and she said, you know, usually on Easter, you always talk about the events leading up to the cross. How about talking about the events after the cross? Uh, what is our response to the cross? What are we supposed to do uh, as a response to what Jesus did on the cross? And so that sparked uh, an idea of how I wanted to approach tonight's message. So I got I to gotta give my wife props first, you know, that uh, she, she gave me uh, part of the idea for this. We all know that Jesus' primary purpose was to become the payment for our sin. That was his primary goal in life was to live a sinless life and pay for the sin of mankind, to give us a path back to right standing with God. We're thankful for it, amen? amen. That was Jesus' primary purpose. But did Jesus have a secondary purpose? Well, we're gonna talk about that tonight. The title of the message tonight is Passing the Baton. So I wanna start with a very popular story from Jesus' ministry. Uh, I've taught on this before. I'm sure just about everybody here has read this story before or heard teaching on it. Matthew chapter 17, it says, When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. My son has seizures and he's suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or he falls into the water. Now I need to stop here for a moment. This man comes up to Jesus and he kneels before him. And he says, Lord, have mercy on my son. Sounds like he's kind of begging for Jesus' help, is, is he not? Yes. Kind of desperate, isn't he? Yes. Well, let me make something clear tonight. Faith doesn't beg. You wanna know why faith doesn't beg? Because royalty doesn't beg. And we are, the Bible says, we have royal position in the kingdom. You are no longer foreigners and strangers. You're citizens of the kingdom of God and you're members of the royal household, the Bible says. The Bible says we've been made kings and priests. The Bible says we are a royal priesthood. You're royalty. Throw your hand in the air and say, I'm royalty. Because of what Jesus did, he made us royalty in the kingdom. So faith simply recognizes and acknowledges the position that we have in Christ. And faith confidently receives what our covenant offers us. It doesn't beg. So I'm going to say it like this. And if you're taking notes, you can write it down. The moment you resort to begging God, you're no longer in faith. Now... Faith isn't arrogant, but faith is confident. So if you're begging God, then you're not in a fully persuaded, single-minded, tenacious agreement with God and his word. Because if you were fully persuaded and single-minded and tenaciously in agreement, you would realize that you don't have to beg. Faith confidently understands the position that we have in Christ and faith confidently understands how the kingdom operates. Tap into the kingdom. Don't beg. Amen? Nudge the person next to you and say, tap into the kingdom. Don't beg. Amen. So let's read on what this guy has to say to Jesus, this father. He says, I brought my son to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Here's Jesus' response. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Now, we've talked about this many times before, but I want to remind you again. When the answer does not come, when the prayer is not answered, when the healing does not manifest, when the miracle doesn't come, Jesus considers that perverse. 
You know, we think of the word perverse or perverted or perversion. We think of some old man trying to lure a little girl into his van. But perversity is anything that is against the norm. That's what perversity is. Jesus says that the answered prayer should be the norm. The healing should be the norm. The manifested miracle should be the norm. Anything else is perverse. He says, you're an unbelieving and perverse generation. this, This answer, this boy should have been healed. He wasn't. There's perversity going on. So what did Jesus do? Next verse. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. When was he healed? Dang, that was fast. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and they asked, why couldn't we drive out that demon? Jesus replied, because of your unbelief. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, You can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Do you believe that tonight? I've told you this before as well, but I'll remind you of this too. Unbelief is one of the primary blockers to the operation of the kingdom. Unbelief cannot be counseled with. Unbelief cannot be helped. Unbelief cannot be soothed. You must eradicate unbelief. You must replace unbelief with belief. That is the only answer for unbelief. It's got to be eradicated. Unbelief is what will cause you to beg God instead of operating in kingdom principles. Because if you believed God, you would know you don't have to beg. But if you can eradicate unbelief and tap into a true belief and a true faith, what does Jesus say? Nothing will be impossible for you. Nothing is impossible to those who believe. You want to accomplish the impossible? Replace your unbelief with belief. You want to receive your miracle? Feed your faith. Starve your doubt. You want to achieve what no one else says that you can achieve? Devour God's word and in so doing, renew your mind to what God's word says about your situation. Renew your mind to what God says is possible. Stop feeding your unbelief. Stop speaking in agreement with your unbelief. Stop speaking and acting contrary to God's kingdom principles. Amen? But even though all of this, I think we all understand this, and this is all well and good, and this is all vital information to achieve the results that you're after, all of this is necessary to develop your faith walk, all of this is good teaching, good preaching, but it's not what I want to focus on tonight. I want to look at something else that Jesus said. Let's go back to verse 17. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Now folks, make no mistake about it. These are not the words of a happy person. Jesus is disappointed in the way that his disciples handled this situation. This miracle should have happened. This healing should have come. So he calls them unbelieving and perverse. Now remember... These are his closest companions. These are his 12 go-to guys. These are his friends. These are the ones that Jesus has entrusted parts of his ministry to. And yet their failure prompts him to call them unbelieving and perverse. I don't know about you, but I would hate to be someone that Jesus refers to as unbelieving and perverse. But I would also like to hope that if Jesus ever did call me unbelieving and perverse, that I would be humble enough and moldable enough to receive his correction and to make changes in my life for the better. Amen? Folks, it doesn't feel good when we're corrected. But if the shoe fits, 
wear it. And look, if the shoe doesn't fit, don't try to cram your foot into it. Amen? But if the shoe fits, own up to the fact that you've fallen short. Own up to the fact that you've fallen into unbelief or that you've fallen into some sort of sin or whatever it is. Own up to it. Repent of that behavior. Pick yourself up. Dust yourself off. Make the appropriate changes that you need to make to your life and get back up on that horse. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. The Bible says that in Romans. But that doesn't mean that we can't short circuit God's plans through our own unbelief and our own disobedience. So this is a serious thing. I'm going to say it like this. The quicker we are to acknowledge our own shortcomings, the less likely we will be to delude ourselves into thinking that faith doesn't work. I'm going to say that again because it got real quiet on that one. <laughs> the quicker that we are to acknowledge that we fell short, the less likely we are to delude ourselves into thinking that faith doesn't work, that God doesn't work, that his word doesn't work. Well, Pastor Heath, I don't know. I, I did everything absolutely perfectly, and God still didn't come through. You know, Pastor Heath, I prayed, I fasted, I believed. I guess God just doesn't heal like we thought he did. I guess God just doesn't deliver us like, like his word says he, he does. I guess God isn't a miracle working God. Folks, that's a dangerous place to be. Where you think that the disconnect is on God's part. That's a, that's a dangerous place to be. That's not where you want to be. But as good as all of this is, this also is not what I wanted to focus on. So let's look at verse 17 one more time. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Can you sense the frustration that Jesus is displaying here? Now, why was he frustrated? He's frustrated because Jesus' primary mission was to live a sinless life and go to the cross. That was his primary purpose. Now, why did he have to live a sinless life? Because if he had any sins of his own to pay for, then the death on the cross wouldn't have paid for yours. What does the Bible say? The wages of sin is death, right? The way, it's, it's a mathematical equation. Sin equals death. The wages of sin is death. But when Jesus had a death, but he had no sin to pay for, now his, sin, his death is eligible to pay for all of your sin. The wages of your sin is his death. Amen? So that was Jesus' primary purpose. But his secondary purpose is vitally important. His secondary purpose is to pass on his ministry to a generation that would carry on his legacy. That's his secondary purpose. Folks, it's not enough for Jesus to simply go to the cross because if there's no one left to point people to the cross, then the cross is a waste. If Jesus can't, re if Jesus can't reproduce himself in others, then his ministry dies when he ascends into heaven. Right? Because there's nobody left to point people to Jesus. There's no lasting impact. So Jesus says, how long shall I stay with you? In other words, he's saying, disciples, you've got to get this so that I can go on and fulfill the rest of my kingdom destiny and the rest of my purpose. I can't stay around here forever, guys. You've got to learn how the kingdom works. You've been with me throughout my entire ministry. You've seen me do this before. You've seen me cast out demons before. You've seen me heal the sick. You should know by now how this works. I shouldn't have to handhold you through this. By now, you should be thinking the way I think and doing the things that I do and operate the way that I operate. Come on, disciples. You got to do better than this. This is what Jesus is saying. 
Now, I'm going to put this in a little bit more of a modern example for us, a little more relevant answer for us. When you come to church, your job is not to observe. Your job is to observe and learn and most importantly, do. The disciples needed to observe the way Jesus worked to learn how Jesus operated, but then do the things that he did. Go therefore. <laughs> Go therefore into all the world. Why? Because I've taught you how. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 14, he tells us to earnestly desire spiritual gifts. Why? So that we can operate in them. Not so that we can watch others operate in them. He says, earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially so that you may prophesy. So we shouldn't be coming to church with the idea of, wow, I can't wait to see if somebody prophesies. No, our attitude is, Lord, speak through me. Prophesy through me. Heal through me. Deliver through me. Preach through me. Move through me. Amen. Amen. Jesus spent his entire ministry pointing people to the Father. And Jesus wants us to point people to the Father as well. Now, how do we do this? We do it the same way Jesus did it. What did Jesus do? He taught the kingdom and he healed the sick. He taught the kingdom, he healed the sick. Over and over again, we see in the Bible, Jesus taught the kingdom, he healed the sick. Let me show you a pattern. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. Teaching what? Proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. What did Jesus do? He taught the kingdom and he healed the sick. Let's skip down a few uh, chapters to chapter 9. Verse 35, Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Again, Jesus taught the kingdom and healed the sick. What is the kingdom? It's God's government, God's way of doing things, God's system of operation. Jesus taught that and he healed the sick. Well, that's what Jesus did. What did the 12 disciples do? Luke chapter 9. When Jesus had called the 12 disciples together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So they set out and went from village to village, proclaiming the good news, the good news of what? The kingdom and healing people everywhere. So Jesus sent the 12 disciples out to teach the kingdom and heal the sick. Same thing that he had done. Luke chapter 10. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. So Jesus would send these teams of people out to the cities where he was going to go preach. He sent them ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. So, Jesus taught the kingdom and healed the sick. He sent the 12 disciples out to teach the kingdom and heal the sick. And here we see he sent 72 other disciples, two by two, to do what? Teach the kingdom, heal the sick. So if that's what Jesus did, and if that's what the 12 disciples were to do, and that's what he told the 72 disciples to do, doesn't it stand to reason that that's exactly what Jesus wants us to do? Yeah. Teach the kingdom, heal the sick. Yeah. That's what he wants us to do. Notice I said us, yes. not me. Yes. <laughs> not just a handful of leaders in the church, but the entire body of Christ. Jesus wants to pass the baton to us. 
He wants us to carry on his legacy. He wants us to further the cause of Christianity. How? In the same fashion that he did it. By preaching the kingdom and healing the sick. So let's go back to Matthew chapter 17. You unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Jesus is essentially saying to the disciples, if you can't learn how to do what I do, then I can't go on to my next assignment. My next assignment is to go to the cross. And Jesus talks about his next assignment. He, he talks about it in uh, John chapter 14. He says, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. I've got to stop here for a moment. Jesus says, if you can't believe in my words, at least believe in the miraculous works that you see. At least believe in the miracles that you're seeing. And folks, this is why you can't just teach the kingdom. You got to teach the kingdom and heal the sick. Teach the kingdom and operate in the supernatural power of God. Why? Because some won't believe what you say, but they will believe what they see. And we serve a powerful God. And we serve a God who empowers us by his Holy Spirit. Next verse. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. So Jesus is saying, look, if you believe in me, you won't just spectate. If you believe in me, you will do what I have been doing. And you won't just do what I've done. You'll do even greater works than I did because I'm going to the Father and I'm passing the baton to you. You're going to do even greater things than I did. Next verse. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. I want you to think about this for a moment. Jesus says, I will do whatever you ask in my name. In other words, if you ask in my name, if you ask on behalf of me, if you choose to operate as my representative, I'll do whatever you ask. Why? Because this was the goal all along. To pass the baton to you. So if you operate on my behalf, I'll do whatever you ask. Because that's what, that's, 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 that was the whole goal. That was the whole point. Let's see what else he has to say. Let's skip down to verse 26. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father. If you love me, Jesus is saying, you're going to be glad that I'm going on to my next assignment. Because this means that since I'm going on to my next assignment, I can pass your assignment on to you. You're going to be glad that I went to the Father. Because, because now you get to carry out what I've been doing. The Holy Spirit is going to teach you and he's going to remind you of all of the kingdom principles that I've been trying to teach you throughout my ministry. Why? so that you can carry on the work of the ministry. You can carry the baton. Amen? Amen. Folks, I am glad that Jesus died for my sin. Yes. I am glad that all of my sins, past, present, and future, are eternally paid for through the work of the cross. I am glad that through faith in Jesus 
and the finished work that he accomplished on the cross, I'm in right standing with God. I'm glad for that. But additionally, I am glad that Jesus chose to pass his ministry to us. He chose to use us to teach his kingdom and to heal the sick. He chose us to be the vessels that would do even greater works than he did. He chose to pass the baton to us. So this Easter, let's not just rejoice in our risen Savior, although that's, that's a good thing to rejoice in. Let's not just rejoice in the empty tomb. Let's also rejoice that Jesus saw fit to pass his ministry, his teaching, his kingdom principles, his anointing, his empowerment to us. One more point and I'm going to close. Remember when we said a few moments ago that if you can't believe in the teaching, at least believe in the miraculous works? Jesus said that. I want to check out what Jesus said to some followers of John the Baptist. These guys came to check out Jesus' ministry. John the Baptist sent them. Luke chapter 7, verse 20. When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John the Baptist what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. So these guys, these followers of John the Baptist, they come to check Jesus' ministry out. Are you the coming one, Jesus? Are you the Messiah? Are you the one that we've been waiting for? And what did Jesus say? Notice Jesus did not say, if you want the proof of my ministry, check out my seven-part teaching series on blessing blockers. Jesus did not say, the proof of my ministry is, check out the size of my congregation and how many people are following me. That should be proof enough. Jesus did not say, hey, if you want to know the proof of who I am, buy my latest book. He didn't say that, did he? He didn't say, listen to my teachings. No, Jesus said, the proof that I am who I say that I am is found in the miracles that are wrought through my ministry. Deaf ears are opened. Blind eyes are opened. The lame are walking. Lepers are cleansed. The dead are raised. The miraculous is in operation through my ministry. That's the proof that I am who I say I am. This is another way of saying, look, if you don't believe my words, at least believe the evidence of the works that you're seeing. The miraculous works. But more important than all of that is for us to realize that all of these miraculous works and even greater works are available to you and me. They're available to us. Why? Because one of Jesus' priorities in his ministry was to pass the baton to you and me. It wasn't just about Jesus going to the cross and dying for our sin. It was about going to the cross and passing his ministry on to us. We are the body of Christ. We are his arms and legs and his feet. Your position in the kingdom, salvation is not just about getting saved and then waiting for heaven. No, it's about getting saved, getting into right standing with God and then saying, Lord, what do you want me to do for the kingdom? What do you want me to do to further the cause of Christ? How can I use my giftings, my anointing, my abilities to further the cause of Christ in this world? Pass the baton to me, Jesus. I'll walk with it. I'll run with it. I'll go where you tell me to go. I'll say what you tell me to say. 
I'll do what you tell me to do. And when you do, Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, I'll give it to you. Because you're operating on my behalf. You're operating in my name. Isn't that good news tonight? Can you give God praise for it? Hi, I'm Heath. And I'm Louise. Thanks so much for watching. Please do us a favor and remember to like this video and subscribe to our channel. Also, comment below. Connect with us and let us know if there's anything we can pray about. If you enjoyed this video, we believe you'll enjoy it even more to visit us in person at Faith Life Worship Center in Naples, Florida. You can find Faith Life Worship Center on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or through our website, faithlifenaples.com. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.